me kick things off. Uh, hello and welcome to this Purdue Engineering Distinguished Panel and Lecture. Uh, my name is John Sutherland. I am the Fazenfeld Head of Purdue's Environmental and Ecological Engineering Department, or as we say, Triple E. Welcome to what I expect will be an exciting and thought-provoking panel involving our distinguished lecturer, Professor Julian Allwood, who comes to us from Cambridge University. Uh, following today's panel session, we will have Professor Allwood's lecture. So we're doing things a little bit different today, first the panel, then the lecture. For both the panel and the lecture, if you have questions, please feel free to enter them into the chat. To kick off this panel session, let me introduce Miriam Stevens, who will serve as the moderator for the panel. Ms. Stevens is a fourth year PhD student in Tripoli. E. Her research is focused on the extent to which the US can circularize its critical material supply chains. She primarily works on forecasting the expected availability of reusable battery materials. She is advised by Professor Shweta Singh. Miriam, please take it away. Thanks, Professor Sutherland. Um, yeah, so hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us um, today to think about this topic. Um, so I'm going to introduce the panelists and then we'll get started. We're very fortunate to have these four researchers and designers of solutions here with us um, who are willing to share their perspective on the theme. So our panelists are um, Dr. Julian Allwood, who's a professor of engineering in the environment at Cambridge University, um, Dr. Goche Asandaran, who is, is an, who is an associate professor of management at Purdue University, um, Dr. Howarder, John Howarder, um, associate professor of materials engineering and of environmental and ecological engineering at Purdue, uh, and also Dr. Miriam Valet Lizancos, who is an assistant professor of civil engineering at Purdue. Um, so the format of the panel will be as follows. Um, I'll ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and their work briefly um, and any introductory uh, thoughts on the topic. And then after introductions, we'll have a discussion um, guided by some questions that I'll ask. And then for the last 15 minutes, starting at about 10 after, we'll open it up to the audience for questions. Um, so as Dr. Sutherland said, if you have questions at any point, feel free to put them into the chat. Um, and we will come back to them at the end, at which point I think we'll also allow you to digitally raise your hand and um, unmute yourself and ask your question yourself. Um, yeah, so to get us started, um, to each of our panelists, would you please take a minute or so to introduce your work and how it relates to the theme and share any initial thoughts you have on what is the role of engineering in delivering decarbonization at speed and scale? And so that is our theme. Um, but also keep in mind that I think we should expand it to include um, not only engineers or including uh, in what we are referring to as engineers as people who um, are designers of business models and markets. Um, so yeah, and I'll propose that we start with Dr. Allwood uh, and then have Dr. Vilay Lisankos go, um, followed by Dr. Sandran and then Professor Howarder. Brilliant. Thanks, Miriam. In one minute, then, you'd like me to summarise my career to date and everything I'm going to say in the one hour lecture uh, coming up after this. So that's no difficulty at all. Uh, my title is Professor of Engineering in the Environment, uh, and I mucked around in my career trying to find something to do until about 20 years ago. I spotted that everybody talking about climate mitigation was trying to reshape the problem to fit their current expertise. Uh, and you can see why, because that's the tradition of what we do in universities. But it was coming up with a very incoherent response. So I decided to take the step of abandoning any idea of having any expertise, but to focus on the problem and to grip it with my teeth and not let go. And that's revealed a whole series of opportunities for research and innovation that I think were uh, largely hidden. Initially, that was all about material efficiency. So in 2011, we published a book saying uh, that there were no uh, means to produce the bulk materials, steel, cement, paper, plastic, and aluminium at the scale we want them uh, with a more efficient or lower emitting process. So we would have to use less materials. So I rebranded my research group as the Use Less Group, which is a little bit of British humor that even Germans seem to understand. 
Um, and uh, since then, we have been promoting using less as a core element of climate mitigation. Over the last five years, we've expanded it way beyond the material system and to try and have a calling card to politicians who aren't used to saying either use less or demand reduction. We're setting up spin out companies as fast as we can to try and promote the idea that there is growth in businesses that reduce the total national demand for energy and materials. Is that enough? And I could keep going because I'm a that professor. Was, I can go on for any amount of time. That was but, enough for now. We will, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, so I think it's my turn. So my name is Miriam Belayli Tancos and I am assistant professor at Purdue University in Civil Engineering. And my research uh, was initially focused on CO2 capture, CO2 reduction, waste valorization, but then I also came to the realization that that's not enough. Uh, so then uh, we were starting to do other things. Well, first of all, of course, durability, because if something is more durable, then uh, you don't have to rebuild it over and over. And also optimization to use less material. But uh, lately, what we are doing is try to uh, to be to make uh, you know concrete and other materials proactive in a way that it will help to reduce uh, uh, pollution. You know, far from try to do net zero or something, just have a system with you know this very large uh, uh, amount that we use, and also with this very large surface that is occupying, and try to make it work for us. So that's one of my primarily focus right now: proactive materials, materials that can uh, help to to uh, uh, can you know, let's say clean the air in different ways. And we can go uh, for more details later on. Thank you, and thank you so much for it. Thank you. Uh, I think it's my turn now. Uh, my name is Gökçe Sandran. I'm an associate professor uh, at the School of Business. And um, I uh, started working on remanufacturing as a master's student. And um, my background is in industrial engineering. At the time, I was a little uh, concerned about everything we do. It was just focusing on um, maximizing profits for the companies. And when I came across the idea of remanufacturing and refurbishing at the time, I was really excited to uh, think about this um, possibility for firms uh, that they can uh, do something relatively good for the environment while still maximizing their profits. At the time, the concept of circular economy, at least the terminology was not there, um, but I kept working on uh, remanufacturing, refurbishing, circular economy type of models. And uh, again, initially, uh, I didn't think about decarbonization benefit of such activities, but they are becoming more important. Um, as uh, we focus on uh, decarbonization. And I also have some work on carbon offsets, uh, which uh, are not perfect instruments by any means, but uh, I try to uh, understand how we can make them better. Thank you. Great, so, so I, I think I'll round out these introductions. Uh, my name is John Howarder. I'm an associate professor in materials engineering which is where all my degrees are in. And then I'm also an associate professor in environmental and ecological engineering. And John Sutherland, our first introducer, uh, is my department head there. So, so a little bit of my background, I, I started work um, as a materials technologist and I used uh, as a way of confession, a lot of really nasty chemicals, chemicals that eventually got banned by the EPA. And that was maybe my moment of realization um, that if I'm gonna continue, making new materials, I need to get a little bit smarter about this. And this was around 2010. Um, and, and when I took this position at Purdue, my research began to transition uh, more and more rapidly into a more generally circular material mindset. So at first it was, how do I make a cleaner material? And now we work in how we recycle material, how we recover material, and how we make cleaner materials uh, to begin with. But as it relates to the theme, I would say that um, as time has gone on, all of my project sponsors care about some sort of bottom line that's more than just money now. And, and decarbonization is often the inspiration for why they want to embark on whatever project we're, we're doing towards that circularity uh, mindset. So um, so with that, I'll, I'll pass the mic back to Miriam and, and we can uh, dive into your questions. Okay. Um, I might go with a different one next. So. 
what do what do each of you see as the biggest challenges to decarbonizing the global and or um, your own national economies? Are we going to stick to the same order, Miriam, or are you going to change the order? Um, if it, so, if at any point anyone has like really pressing thoughts, feel free to just go ahead. Um, but if there's like a lull, I'll call on you. Um, maybe Dr. Allwood, if you'll start us off this time, and then we can switch it up. I'll start and pick up also on what you asked last time, which I didn't answer very well. I think the biggest challenge is that politicians uh, would like to find a solution that nobody notices. So it would be great if we could find what I would call magic beans fertilized by unicorns blood that come along and deliver exactly the same economy, but with no emissions. Um, and at the moment, they've latched on to two phrases, uh, which or maybe three phrases that appear to allow that. And those are carbon capture and storage, hydrogen and negative emissions technologies. And the fact that politicians believe that those three three things are near to market and can scale rapidly is stopping them from talking about anything else. Um, but actually, those things cannot scale rapidly. Uh, it doesn't matter how much we'd like them to happen. They cannot grow rapidly because they're all dependent on a large system change. So I think engineers have been... Um, unhelpful in giving politicians license to that because they're of course a source of innovation funding um, and our traditional role has been as the inventors of profitable technologies that we chuck over the wall into the world of business and they turn it into profit. What I think we need to do is to be part of a political dialogue about the whole system of change which embraces the reality of living differently as well as all the opportunities to make new technologies grow. So if you like to bring about not just the skills we have in innovation, but the skills we have in whole systems thinking and project delivery, which I think are let it get being forgotten in the excitement that new magic beans might take the problem away without anybody noticing. I'll just follow up and and and, and I think related to the political mindset, I think there's also a time scale mismatch of people's expectations, right? So so, you know, I mentioned, you know, my grants, my funding agencies, they're thinking on a short term time scale, like the politicians, because often the money originates from their decisions. Right. Yet we have this target that's kind of inspiring this discussion about a net zero 2050 goal. Right. And so I think I think setting those expectations and then the expectations of time to market. Right. So so, you know, you mentioned, hey, these technologies are not going to come online in some certain time. And if that's not the pleasing answer to someone, well, sometimes that shuts down a conversation a little bit prematurely. Um, so, so if I could if I could wave a wand before we get to the unicorn blood and say, you know, if we could just have a, a broader base of of education on this, so it's not just the engineers, so it's whoever the engineer, you know, and I'm thinking about myself as the engineer, but whoever I'm talking to across the table has maybe a higher baseline of understanding of these problems, whether politician or not. <clears throat> Yeah, and I think another big problem is that the perspective in different regions and different areas is different. So, you know, convincing everyone with the same argument will be very difficult to just try to work all together in the same direction. You know, the you know, the consequences we will deal all with them, no matter if we want or not. But the the thing is we are living in the, the full world. And that's I think a big challenge because you know, different regions are in different states of development. It's very difficult to find just one solution. I think, you know, whoever claims is just, you know, this is just the solution it cannot be. There, there might be many solutions and all of them might work together. And of course, it will take time. And the problem is, yeah, politician has, you know, four year term or whatever term. And then it's uh, this is what they want. <laughs> they want to see something in this time. And that's a, that's a very challenging part. But society in general, how how we transmit, you know, the urgency to the society and the importance. I think it's something that, I, I mean, I, I don't think engineers are, uh, you know, well-trained for that and we have to improve on that. It's, it's not only the knowledge and also it's, it's how to transmit this to, to the society and that's very challenging. I completely agree with you, Miriam. And I don't know, I think in the US you have a broader undergraduate degree because you have the idea of a minor. Uh, we don't have that over here. So, uh, our engineers uh, graduate having had no exposure to the idea of an argument. Unfortunately, we teach them that all answers or all problems have a right or wrong answer. 
that you can check. And the only times that they come across doubt is when they do a design exercise where there is choice. But the idea of playing a role in a political discussion is alien and completely untrained. And I wish we could bring that in as a normal part of engineering education for exactly the reason that you've just said. Yeah, maybe related to that, I I I I, I think uh, regulators also need to understand the business dynamics um, better. Uh, even uh, regulations that are imposed with good intentions uh, in hard may sometimes backfire. For example, uh, if you impose recycling targets um, without really understanding how it is going to affect the dynamics in the market, the competition in the market. Uh, it may lead uh, to uh, uh, you know reduction in remanufacturing or refurbishing, which is not something you may want to do at the end. So I think uh, from a regulator's policymaker's perspective, uh, it's important for them to understand the business dynamics and, and how the um, requirements they impose on the market would eventually uh, play out. Um, so. Great, thank you all. Um, you've already hit on um, several points leading up to this next question that I was going to address. But so you sort of acknowledge that like technological solutions are not going to save us. They can't be scaled in time. And even if they could, um, if we keep carrying on as we do, we'll eventually we'll just continue to surpass the carrying capacity of the earth and collapse eventually anyway. Um, so with, with all of that in mind, um, how should we prioritize investment in different decarbonization technologies, both leading up to 2050? Uh, so until we reach climate goals, and then after that. I'm happy to keep going first, but I don't, I, uh, I'm equally happy for somebody else to take over if you'd like to. Um, it's a really tough question, isn't it? But I think what's happening at the moment is that the only thing that's getting investment are supply side technologies. Um, and if you look at the statements of John Kerry, for example, uh, he made the utterly ridiculous statement that half the technologies that will be required to deliver net zero by 2050 haven't yet been invented. Well, I'm afraid that's complete rubbish because we cannot scale them uh, fast enough. Um, and looking at the Breakthrough Foundation, I was talking to with one of your uh, faculty earlier on, they have a, a predilection for new technologies that have very large scale impact. And so they're focusing on things like negative emissions technologies, which are almost certain not going to be able to deliver because they require so much energy and we won't have the energy to power them. So I think a really valid question is how we uh, work with investors to create a slightly different class of assets, which is the assets that are if in the world of resource efficiency, which deliver with more certainty, um, maybe have lower capital requirements, and maybe have less excite, exciting growth, but are nevertheless profitable and worth backing. Um, I think uh, I'm not the person in the business school, so uh, somebody else is going to be able to articulate that much better than I can. Uh, but we aren't prioritizing demand side activities in the way I think we could. Professor Asandran, I'm curious maybe what your thoughts are on his answer and then also how, how, how you would, I don't know, recommend prioritizing. Um, yeah, um, I, I, I completely agree. Uh, I, I mean, uh, I think uh, customer needs and wants drive the market. So uh, if uh, we can find ways uh, to um, um, for customers to want those products or those solutions uh, that require decarbonization, firms will be more willing to invest on those. Um, so this, um, I, I completely agree with that. And um, maybe in terms of uh, pr prioritizing uh, different solutions, uh, I could, because I do some research on carbon offsets, I, I can also and um, my, my view on that. So firms uh, invest in technology, so they have their targets, uh, emission reduction targets, they invest in some technologies and wherever they can uh, not do more then they start buying carbon offsets uh, to um, meet those goals they set. Uh, so I think um, there is a lot needs to be done uh, there as well uh, in terms of regulating and those carbon offset markets 
and so that firms cannot rely on those so much in order to meet the targets they set. And that way they will have to look into the, their own operations and their own um, supply chain more to find uh, internal solutions uh, and, and lead to absolute emission reductions. Miriam, may I come back in? I think it's time we had some controversy. And I just want to respond to the word of carbon offsets that have come up twice. In Europe in the 1500s, the Catholic Church used to sell something called indulgences. And these were a way of buying yourself out of having committed a sin. And in some cases, you could buy them before you committed the sin. Now, the experimental evidence isn't in yet because we haven't had time to get to heaven and count up who got in and who didn't. But the overall evaluation from churches since then is that selling offsets, uh, not offsets, sorry, selling indulgences wasn't in fact a pathway to heaven. So I would like to put in a word for saying that there are no offsets that work. It's an entirely fake uh, industry um, that that's giving you the illusion that you can keep emitting um, and uh, feel okay about it. But if you think about it, your emitting activity occurs now. So the only plausible offset is one that negates emissions now to the same um, effect. And nobody has yet invented one that does that. So in the nicest possible way, but with a sort of hint of wanting a little bit of controversy, I think we should knock the offsets idea on the head. No, I, I completely agree. I, I mean, I, I think there are uh, currently a broken mechanism, um, but um, my uh, understanding is they are not going away. Uh, it, it would be nice if they maybe somehow completely, uh, like, like you said, uh, ter- um, get fixed or disappear, <laughs> but they are not going away. So, um, and, and th- that's why we, I think, need to figure out uh, ways to either make them more efficient or uh, regulate them so that they become um, a little more effective than they are right now. But I, I completely agree that it's, it's a broken mechanism and it's definitely not the solution. So so if I could ask, if it's a broken mechanism, if it's not a solution, why is it so enticing? Why is it what we have? Because because when I hear this, what I hear is we've got bad legislation kicking around and we just have to tolerate it. And and I run into this a little bit in, in the recycling end because there are regulations that prevent the valorization of certain kinds of waste. And it's like, well, that's in some ways that's impeding a sustainable progress. But everyone says, well, it's just it's a regulation. What can we do? So why do we have bad offset thinking to begin with? Uh, one thing is, uh, I, I think price is too cheap, and that's why it is appealing for companies. So the real price of uh, um, c- carbon should be much higher than uh, the current market price, and, and th- th- that's a problem. Uh, and that's why companies find it attractive, so they can easily offset their emissions because it's much cheaper than so- trying to uh, achieve absolute reductions. So this burst of global inflation has not inflated the carbon market too? Uh, if you're telling not, me the price not, is too low? N- n- not enough, I think. <laughs> but actually, I think John's raised a really important point there, that the driver of change in recycling hasn't been pricing, but regulation. And the reason is that we think of it as a health and safety problem. Mm-hmm. So we didn't get rid of asbestos because of pricing. We got rid of it because we became afraid of it. And actually... Everything that we're doing at the moment, I think, is on the journey to seeing climate change as a health and safety problem, because then you regulate and then you reshape the economy within the rules that you've now regulated things that are harmful to human health. So I think there's a really good template there. And oddly, in Europe, the legislation that's been most important about climate is the banning of um, combustion engine cars. So from 2030, roughly, Mm. in Europe, you won't be allowed to sell a car um, with a combustion engine. And that came about not because of climate, but because the public became concerned about pollution, in particular about particulates. Obviously, the public don't know what particulates are, but it was sold in the media as being bad. And everybody bought into it being bad. And then very rapidly, the government passed or the European Union passed legislation to ban combustion engines, which is fantastic. 
So um, it would be great if we could colour carbon dioxide pink so that everybody could see it and feel the harm of having it around. Um, but I feel that's that's going to be too difficult. But I think the recycling example is terrific for showing us the right direction for the policy we want to end up with. Yeah, that's an interesting point about the combustion engine too, because because that's a lever that that right now in the U.S. people say, well, look to Europe, that's what's coming next, and that combustion engine change. You know, I don't know that there's a legislation in the United States that has, has done that, but there's many companies in the U.S. that have basically said we're done making this, at least this model, this platform um, on combustion, and and so so I think one little point of optimism that I have is that is that there are these kind of sea change moments. That happen sometimes for, as you mentioned, almost trivial reasons, right? But um, yeah, very interesting. So, um, so while, I, yeah, I think this, I think our panel might diverge away a little bit from like specific technologies themselves. But before we do that, um, since we're already on the subject of net um, negative emissions and offsets, uh, I did want to ask about cement um, and concrete and get. Um, your general thoughts on that, but especially Dr. Allwood and Dr. Valle Lizanko's thoughts. So, um, so what are the challenges and opportunities you see related to concrete in the decarbonization um, of human activity? Um, is its potential for sequestration, um, the potential to increase uh, energy efficiency in its production, um, and options for cement uh, substitution? Are those things enough to offs offset uh, the emissions intensive nature of its uh, production. Um, and then do you think the sequestration potential of it could be realized in time for like the continued use of concrete, which seems like, I don't know, <laughs> we're not going to stop using concrete um, or that's a big ask, but all of this is a huge ask. Um, yeah. Can, can we fix concrete in time um, for it to be a net sink instead of a net source? Uh -huh. Uh, I don't know if Professor Awood wants to start, or do you want me to start? I want you to start. <laughs> okay, I will say there's a no right answer, but uh, the short one will be uh, no. Uh, the concrete itself cannot just be fixed in a minute, and it cannot be a carbon sink itself. I can tell you a little bit about very quick about you know my own journey <laughs> on how how I approach it. First, when I started to work on concrete, I was thinking there's a lot of waste also, let's do waste valorization. And we did waste valorization and we studied how recycled aggregate can be used in concrete instead of natural aggregate. That was great for uh, abiotic depletion of natural resources, reduction of waste, but it was not great for when you do the full holistic life cycle assessment, you will see that in many cases, it's not the best case because you will need more cement to achieve the same performance. Therefore, it's not an optimization. So then this is when I say, okay, this might be good for some applications, but for other ones not because it requires more cement. Cement, uh, production of cement, um, it is, it is uh, produce CO2, so that's not uh, the best option for some cases. Uh, then the next thing that I, I was thinking was, okay, so let's do a more durable materials. That's something that that works in the sense that you have something more durable, then it stays more time. You are not, you don't need to produce it again. Then you really need, uh, you really can do a, a big impact. The next thing was, okay, concrete captures CO2 naturally, right? Because of carbonation, everyone knows, but it's very slow. Can we accelerate it? And then we went and we did research and we find a way to accelerate it. Is that enough? No. First, because the maximum you can get it's a 40% of uh, the CO2 that you emitted initially. And even if you do it fast, uh, it's not enough. Uh, there are other ways, there are many ways, it's, uh, you know, uh, using supplementary cementitious materials, other things. All of these things uh, we try to combine together and try to see how much we can save and stay. Uh, and still, it's better to have an accelerated carbonation than not. It's, especially if you do not uh, if you do not affect durability, the response is yes. That's why we started to develop a dynamic life cycle assessment, meaning it's not the same if you capture the CO2 slowly than if you do it faster, because at the end of the day, you know, it's like if you pay your debt very fast or slow, it's different. So that's something that we did. And then uh, we realized we need to do something more and we need to do it in a way that also it can be scalable. You know, there's all these things, and then it has to be economically, uh, uh, you know, feasible. 
Uh, I mean, it's not possible to have everything together, but we are doing progress on that sense. And what we are doing now is especially surface treatments and coatings that has photocatalytic activities or other uh, activities that will react with the environment and it will start to decompose, for example, CO2 into less harmful uh, compounds. Still, I mean, we are in the process. It's not something that, you know, every time that we have a press release or something like that, I have to really, uh, you know, make a big effort in a way that is clear and it's not over promising because what media wants is to say, hey, we solved the problem and we see the problem solved every day in the media. And it's the problem first, it's not solvable, this was one solution. And second, it's a problem that, you know, we need to combine many solutions and do it in an effective way. And then again, before I can tell you just one thing and I will stop because I think I'm going too fast, and then, uh, not too fast, but too long on this, is that, uh, you know, at the beginning I was, I do research, basic research, I don't want it to deal with, you know, companies, I, this is a different thing that, now I realize how important it is to not only do the research, not only to you know find solutions, even if not just solution that fits every fit, of course, uh, but then also make sure that this is translated into technology that is usable and that it makes sense. And uh, you know it's a lot, uh, so it, it takes me up at night in a way that I was thinking about all of these things at the same time, and you know, so this is kind of the the realistic. Uh, thing and uh, yeah I'm saying this thing all the time that someone interview me but then when they write things are different <laughs> brilliant uh so uh, Miriam knows far more than I do about reabsorption uh and I have learned a lot from that but the key answer is that it doesn't work very effectively and it takes a very long time um I had a really great meeting an hour ago with your colleague uh, Luna Lu who had a very nice way of expressing uh, the strategies that exist at the moment about dealing with emissions. So as we stand, there are no means to produce cement with no emissions, uh, but there are a lot of snake oil salesmen claiming that they can do it. They can't. Um, so the three strategies available to us are to use less clinker when we make cement, and primarily that's about using supplementary cementitious materials um, that has been largely granulated blast furnace slag and fly ash uh, so far, but they're both the products of highly combusting emitting industries. So that's a short term one that's going to close. The more exciting one is calcined clay. Um, then you can think about using less cement by blending the concrete accurately. Most concretes use more cement than they should do, uh, and that's wasteful. Um, so we know that we can do better. But I think the really fun engineering one is using less concrete. If you think about it, the uh, only really efficient use of concrete is a dam. So a dam has roughly the same aspect ratio of an eggshell, and it's because the water transfer transfers uh, pressure to load in the concrete um, through a, a perfectly compressive system. So you can design a, a dam that uses concrete optimally. In contrast, if you ever use concrete to make a bending element, then half the concrete is wasted because concrete has no strength in tension. It's only strong in compression. Uh, but it's worse than that because only the very top element of the concrete is being loaded properly. So there is an opportunity to rethink construction completely based on shell elements that look like dams as opposed to beam elements, which we know are wasteful. And I think there is a huge opportunity there. However, uh, what Luna started from was using less clinker, but she was assuming that the clinker was um, going to come from a conventional cement kiln. But in the spirit of Netflix, I can tell you that in part two of this series, the lecture I should be giving in an hour, towards the end of the lecture, I shall tell you about the world's first means for making clinker with no emissions whatsoever, but I'm not going to tell you now. Yeah, I, I will want to add just one thing. I, I mean, it's it's always you know tempting uh, to say just just substitute concrete directly. Don't use concrete, uh, which should, will be great. But the thing is, the alternatives are not uh, uh, less uh, carbon intensive. If we, for example, build a bridge with steel that we can, uh, the CO two emissions are not lower. Uh, and then not only that, also the durability side is very important. If we build something in a way that it will stay. And if we want to stay, again, we don't want to do something very durable if it's temporary, but 
I really, I am really an advocate to do things to to last. I mean, if if not, it just it just doesn't work. Uh, but uh, what I would say is, you know, we have to find alternatives that it will indeed have a better environmental impact. And also, and not only during the production side, I mean, we have to do it holistically and do the math over the service life. I think that's very important. And there are some applications that concrete doesn't make any sense, but there are other ones that we cannot get rid of. Uh, and again, I mean, it's, I don't think it will go away, but there are many ways to, to do it better. And then, as I said, no matter if it's concrete or any other construction material, we have huge opportunities, not only to just focus on production side and how to reduce that, but also how to make them work. I mean, uh, you know, materials that can react with the environment in different ways. And again, that's <laughs> that's difficult and it, it is important to develop technologies to scale it up in a, in a reasonable way, but it is possible. Everything is possible, not today, but it is possible. Okay. Um, so yes, if we if we can't fix the process, we should try and use less of it. Um, but how do we how do we make that happen? Um, so to everyone, um, so to what degree and how should we try and engineer markets um, to deliver decarbonization? Um, and maybe in what instances are market driven strategies to bring about decarbonization more effective than regulations? Um, what does a focus on either have on the speed at which we can accomplish things? Um, so, so Miriam, I'll just make a short comment um, that relates to the discussion we just had. And it's also a short comment because I don't have a long thought for, the, for this one. Um, but I will just say that there's a lot of industries like concrete where it's something we absolutely have to have. Nobody wants to give it up. And there's no clear path out of it, right? And and I think you know I think Professor Allwood has outlined it in in his work already. You know, aviation aviation is the big one that scares me because I've liked to fly, right? And it's like to say, wait, I have to turn this off? No, no, no. I I don't want to do less with that, right? Um, semiconductors is an area that I work in a lot, and it uses a lot of nasty stuff that has a lot of global warming potential. But we don't want to give up our computers, right? And it's like the alternative to the flight is, hey, we're on Zoom, right? We're doing all this stuff that we have, we feel like we have to do, right? And so the thing I like about market-based solutions is that they cross-cut all these sectors. It's not a regulatory capture of one industry that says, oh, here's this. And the thing that I'm most afraid of is that sectors actually advocate for them to be accepted. Oh, no, no, we're too important to have to, you know, make progress in these areas, right? And so and so the short comment is just that I think I think the market-based solutions are, are a big lead out of it, but um, I'm not the expert in that area. So I will mute myself um, and, and hear what my colleagues have to say. It's uh, an impossibly difficult question, this one, isn't it? For 30 years, economists who have a really broad diversity of opinions have all told us that you need a carbon price and that will solve everything. Um, and there's two problems about that. One is that 30 years' experience has told us that we aren't going to have a carbon price because we don't have a global police force to enforce it. You can't have one locally if you don't have one across the borders, and we have no mechanism for enforcing it worldwide. Uh, but the second thing is that a carbon price only works if it, if it causes pain, uh, and the people to whom it's going to cause pain are the poorest people. So politically, it's actually not a great mechanism because the people with the least option to buy their way out of it are going to suffer the most pain. But carbon emissions is fundamentally about the rich. I'll show you a graph on wealth inequality later on. Um, but roughly, your emissions are proportional to your income. And it is therefore the highest income people who are the people that um, can buy their way out of a carbon tax, but who are the ones that we need to be able to control. So I don't think that works. And what we've been looking at is whether uh, a different financial mechanism would be to give better information to markets so they can value share prices better. So John has made a very good point about flying. Um, and I'm maybe I should make the comment now. I'm very grateful to you all for allowing me to talk in this format. I think that's one of the great things we learned from lockdown. But uh, 10 years ago, once I looked at my own carbon footprint, uh, it was completely dominated by flying. That's for, true for almost all academics. And I realized I couldn't continue to fly if I was going to work on this topic with integrity. It's a bit like doing structural mechanics and pretending that Hooke's law doesn't exist. 
So I stopped flying. It took me three years to work off the commitments I'd made. Um, but then I haven't taken on any new commitments since then. And life hasn't ended. It's changed. But I love Zoom because we can make friends uh, in new places. What we spotted with the pledges of the uh, aviation industry, which are all complete hot air, is that they are all depending on three resources that they themselves are not proposing to deliver. So all climate policy depends fundamentally on either emissions-free electricity or on carbon storage or on biomass. And there are no other fundamental resources. So we call those three the three zero emissions resources. And what we tried to work on, and we worked on this with Mark Carney's finance team ahead of COP26, was a finance mechanism to price those so that companies could buy futures in them. So that then if you looked at the balance sheet of uh, an airline, uh, if they said they had a plan to get zero emissions by some date, you could say, have they bought the procurement agreements that give them access to those three resources to produce whatever form of synthetic fuel it is they claim they're going to use? And if they have, great, I believe them, and therefore I maintain the value of the shares. And if they haven't, and absolutely none of them have, then their price should go down. So if you have um, shares in an airline, you should sell them. They are talking complete hot air uh, about climate mitigation. Sadly, as John says, there are no options for flying at scale with zero emissions by 2050. Uh, and I think that's a personal journey we've all got to go on. We've simply got to face that truth. For me, it was a relatively easy one at the stage of career I was at, and my family are all within Europe, so I could do everything by train. Um, and I was wealthy enough to be able to travel by train instead of plane. Uh, it's a different journey for all of us, but we can't face, can't avoid the basic truth that flying dominates your footprint if you use a lot of it, um, and therefore it's something that we have to phase out. Yeah, I think it, it, some it, other controversial things as well, if you like, you know, just to stir it up. It, no, but, but but you know your comment about it being you know there's a personal decision that that goes into it. It's like it's like to me that's the thing that says okay you know having having that market based solution is part of it you know and and um, it, again that's that's out of my realm but um, but it's the part where the, the technology engineer in me says okay it, it's not just engineering that is part of it. It is part of a a social a culture that sort of change right that that has to come along with it. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, no matter what we do, if there's no uh, mindset in the society to either implement it or to give up or some of the privilege we have, it's, it's just not possible. I mean, it's, you know, it's with everything. It's also with waste. It's with everything. I mean, we can choose to to use a reusable cup or a not reusable cup. And I think it it will just depend on, you know, whatever people feel. It is not only engineering. We We just need to to be able to, you know, uh, find a way that this society agrees that this this cannot go on. I agree, but we've got such an important role that we're not playing within that discussion because as a community or as a profession, we are selling the idea that technology will solve the problem. That's on aggregate the message that our profession is giving. Uh, and from what you've just said, Miriam, I think we have a huge responsibility to get involved in political discussion precisely to say that there isn't a magic technology that's going to take the problem away in the time available. So let's think about living in a different way. Um, and part of that, I think, is also to prioritise different ways of assessing welfare. We've been conned by the um, neoclassical economics consensus that GDP growth is the sole measure of welfare. Everybody in the world knows that that's not true. Uh, but we allow it to continue as the main driver of policy. So I think that's a role that we could be part of. We clearly don't have a very strong voice in that, but just to keep reiterating that welfare is not measured by income and celebrating all the other things that we enjoy and reminding them that can grow uh, while we move towards a slightly restrained, uh, acceptable lifestyle. Yeah, I always do this parallelism that, it, you know, we can do the technologies and the technologies can help, but we are just cleaning the mess, right? But if you're in the lab and you just only focus on finding a way to clean the mess, that will not be enough. What you have to do is make sure that to be doing with, we are not making a mess in the lab. So this is kind of the thing, it's not only cleaning. We have to clean a lot anyway, even if we stop now, 
there's a lot of cleanliness. So waste valorization is fine, everything is fine. But in addition to that, we have to to find ways to do not make such a mess in, in the world. I think that's, that's the main thing. But it's difficult because again, society is the one who, who drives that. Thank yeah. you all for your, oh, Professor Sandra, well, please. I, I, I'm, I'm just gonna uh, add to uh, what Miriam said. It, um, I, I completely uh, agree that we need a um, uh, change in mindset in society. And um, it, it, it is though a little di difficult. For example, when I look at in my neighborhood, everyone has a land mower, has a leaf blower. Uh, like we, we don't need that. Not everybody has to own one. Uh, the whole neighborhood needs only one, maybe, but in the whole neighborhood, we have like 25, 30 of them. Uh, so if we, we can get into this mindset of really sharing, um, I, I think we can uh, use less and therefore less production and less uh, use of resources. Uh, but the change of the mindset, especially in the U.S., seems to be, uh, at the time being, at least a bit difficult because people feel entitled to uh, you know, this f feeling of ownership and just consumption and buying more. And, uh, I think that's true at a national level, but at a local level, it's incredible how influential individuals can be. Because if you work with people in your street and suggest something, actually people are surprisingly willing. And once they've touched it and they've got the feeling that sharing a leaf blower was all right, then it becomes something they can be a bit proud of. And that might then start to affect the way that they take other decisions mm -hmm. and the way that they behave at work. So I think there's a really powerful effect there that can be activated by any of us who take a constructive and positive action. Um, just because people like to join in with something which they know to be the right thing, it's rather hard to lead. So that's another role that we can all be playing uh, when we sort of buy into the agenda. Yeah, and, and I will add also another thing is regulations in terms of warranty and durability of, of the things. Uh, I think I think now in Europe it's three years before it was two years warranty for, you know, whatever, uh, you know, for example, a washing machine. Uh, here, I think it's one year. That makes a big difference. I can tell you it will fail in one year and, and one month in many cases. I mean, and then what you will do, they will tell you it's, the same you know, to fix it, you have to pay the same amount of what what the washing machine uh, cost. Uh, this this thing happens, I can tell you. <laughs> but I mean, in many cases, I would say no, I want to fix it. I just I just see all this material, the things I don't want to to just put it in the trash. It's not the, only because the money is because of, of what it means. You know, before you have a, a you know any appliances and it lasts twenty years. It's not that we don't know how to do the appliances in the same way. We still, we all want to have a washing machine, right? But we can have a washing machine that lasts 20 years. It is possible. It happened before. I know because my mother has one, my father has one. Uh, but right now things are built in the way that they do not last. And that's an important thing. And I think regulations will be the only way to go in to stop it. So I really want to continue to like hear your thoughts on how how we reduce consumption essentially, um, and it sounds like yeah, at the individual level and community level, people are very willing to do that. I mean, we don't we know that we don't need more stuff just to have it, um, and so continuing like on that topic is definitely something I would like to continue with. But um, we're reaching the end or the start of the open Q and A session, but there is. Um, in addition to like continuing to talk about this, one more question that I did want to make sure gets asked in some way. And so I'm going to ask that um, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So um, how should securing social permission or societal permission for deploying mitigation um, and adaptation strategies uh, be balanced with the urgent need to deploy them? I think it's an absolutely brilliant question, Miriam. And I've been working on an answer to that uh, over the last year with the brainiest bloke I've ever met, who is has PhDs in chemistry and theology, uh, is a professor of theology here and a vicar, uh, and has a brain the size of a planet. So from all of my work, then uh, it's fundamental that restraint 
is going to be an element of climate mitigation. And if you think about it, all the world's major religions embrace restraint as a normal part of their activity. Everybody promotes that. So uh, with Andrew, we have a book under review with Cambridge University Press on restraint as a component of climate mitigation. And I think that's an area that's been missed because it's not politically attractive. But the idea of activating local communities, whether through faith groups or through civic groups, other communities where people share a set of values, I think has been missed. When I look at the literature of climate mitigation in the sociology, social psychology area, it's very largely focused on individual behavior. And we haven't tried to activate the idea of communities with shared values. So for me, that's become a priority. And I'm trying to raise funding at the moment to do more in that area because we we work well in groups. We're a social being. And I think if we can try and uh, find realistic pathways to support each other in taking good actions, there's a huge lever there that we haven't yet started to play. So there's my starter for 10 on your very good last question. Yeah, very interesting. And I think I'll, I'll definitely look into that, the idea of restraint in that book. Um, that's a personal interest to me. Um, just to clarify, I am, I think, mainly or maybe more so asking about how to get permission for deploying technologies when people are um, hesitant to like have them in their backyard or it'll potentially affect their environment. Um, Miriam, I'll make a, a brief comment on that. I think I think that, you know, Professor Allwood mentioned a few minutes ago uh, with the leaf blower example, but there's this network effect. There's a, there's a community effect, right? And and I think, you know, we as the technologists and the engineers say there's an urgent need to deploy it because look at this chemical equation, look at this model, look at all of the the facts of of the chemistry and physics of it, and and we have a model for the rates of that. We don't necessarily, or at least I don't have a model for the rate of how minds change because of community network effects, but there's a huge urgency for that. And so at the beginning, and I made some comment about how I wish people on the other side of the table were as at least basically informed about these things. And I think there's an urgent need for us, the creators of the information, to disseminate that as broadly as we can so that, that those minds change. Yeah, and I think another problem is the short-term uh, mentality. I mean, I think it's even, I, I don't want to say the food society, but the important part has this short-term uh, mentality. And that's something that it will be very difficult to battle. I mean, it, you can say, you know, in five I don't know, five years that they, they might care. But if you say something will happen in 50 years, may, they might not care even. So that's a problem. Because then they will say, no, I just want to keep driving my car. I want to do everything in the same way. And it's not, I, if I don't face the consequences, I don't care. And that's a big problem. I don't think all the society is like that, thankfully. And I think, you know, with time people will realize, but at the end of the day, you know, it's human nature to try to, to live in the best way they can. And it's just kind of a problem or I don't know if it's a problem, but uh, I think it's, you know, it's, it's not only on us. It's not only on engineers. We, we, we are not the only ones in this equation. And I don't think even if we, unless we, we do magic that we don't, um, I don't think there's a way that we can solve the problem alone. Yeah. In, in terms of, um, Am I on mute? Okay, in, 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 I didn't realize if I was muted or on mute. Um, so in, in, in terms of educating people, um, I, I teach a course on sustainable operations. And uh, every time I teach it, uh, the first week I think, oh, is this material too basic? Uh, I'm maybe not telling them anything that they don't know. Um, and, you know, they're just introduction, uh, first class and second class. We play a simulation game just based on the tragedy of the commons. And to me, uh, the outcome of the simulation game is just so obvious. Every time we play the simulation game, I freak out that, uh, you know, they will beat the game and they won't observe the tragedy of the commons because I, um, I, I think they will know what's going to happen. They will react accordingly. Um, but it never happens. So I've been teaching this course more uh, for more than eight, uh, 10 years now. And there was no one single time, uh, for example, students 
uh, uh, thought about uh, finding a way to alleviate uh, the outcome and avoid the tragedy of the commons. Uh, every time they play the game, uh, they'll go bankrupt uh, because they consume the resources. Uh, and they always say, oh, it is so eye-opening and things like that. So even what I'm trying to say is even, even simple things, even things that we as uh, you know people who have been working and thinking on this issue a lot for us, it may be obvious, but for people who don't work on the topic, even simple things like that, a very simple simulation game can be uh, really um, eye-opening in their own words. <laughs> All right, so in the, in the chat, we have two questions so far. Um, they're both from the same person. Um, so maybe I'll deal with uh, the last one, or I'll ask the last one first, which is, okay, so Jay Gore says, somehow the conversations seem to be pessimist pessimistic to the point of being grim. Are there any silver linings that the panelists and Professor Allwood can share? Um, well, maybe adding to that, what's which is, I think, the last question that I was hoping to ask you all, which is what is an example of a policy technology or other action that you think shows promise or that excites you or that makes you hopeful? You've mentioned some of them. Yeah, so I think the combustion engine regulation is the best regulation that I've seen yet uh, that uh, reduces emissions, and that's terrific. Um, in the talk I'll be giving, then I'm going to mention two startups that we've created, which are growing really well. For the purpose, and they're both great technologies or ideas, um, but the reason we're doing them is to say to government, look, there is hope here, there's uh, opportunity. And the reason I am optimistic is that I think we have to be honest about the fact that the supply side magic bullet don't work. They aren't going to scale fast enough to do uh, the miracle that's expected of them. But by focusing on them, we haven't looked in the entire space of demand side innovation. It isn't a human right that everybody should be allowed to drive a car that weighs 20 times more than the people in it. But that's the average in America. In Europe, we're much, much better because we drive cars that are only 12 and a half times the weight of the people inside them. Um, but the people are way a bit less as well, actually. So there's kind of trade off there. Um, so. Uh, we know that there are a whole range of uh, actions that we haven't even started to think about. And in the course that I teach uh, for um, undergrads and, and taught master's students on climate mitigation, it's growing year on year, and it's all about exploring that demand side space. And my feeling is that the students leave full of passion to go out and find those missing opportunities, uh, which I think are rich um, and fun and interesting and much more effective than dreaming of magic bullets. Yeah, I, I want to add that I, I don't think it's pessimistic at all. I think it's optimistic, but it's also realistic. I mean, if someone tells you that they can solve the problem, uh, this huge problem with just one thing and it just solved the problem, most likely it's not true or it's not completely true, it's half, half true. All these technologies, all these advancements we do, it works and it helps, but it's not enough. I think that's kind of the bottom line. It's not something that we can solve just doing it in one way. So I think it's optimistic. We are making progress, but if we say that with one thing, we are solving everything, I think that will be great, but I don't think it's true. I mean, it's, I'm not saying people lie, but they think just maybe just over promising or things like that. It's just one thing will not solve all the problems. And we have to be, you know, sincere of that. This is, I think this is the truth. And, you know, in terms of optimistic, you know, things or things that might help us to have more hope, as I said, I mean, we did a lot of progress. There's a lot of things we are doing, for example, in, in our area, but now, you know, proactivity of the materials, photocatalysis, other things, we really help to solve the problem. I mean, all of these things are, up. you know, if each of them just, just reduce a 1%, have, and they are synergistic, then we can have a hundred of these things and then we have 100%, right? That's I think that's kind of what I wanted to say. I mean, uh, yes, you know, we do something, it works, it helps to accelerate something or to, to improve something. But saying that one thing, it will solve all the problems and it will be applicable for all the solutions, for all the applications and for all the things, it's, it's just not realistic, I think. But it's optimistic. I mean, we are doing a lot. It's not what's the point of, you know, uh, committing all our lives of, of, of advancing on this. Yeah. 
Well, I gave my answer in the chat because I didn't know if we'd had have, have time to address the question. But but on the contrary, I, I have a very optimistic view. I mean, my my office, the, our dean's office in the College of Engineering sits in the Neil Armstrong building, which is a monument to us going to the moon however many years ago, 50 something years ago. Right. And that didn't happen because, you know, a small cadre of engineers said, hey, we're going to go to the moon. That was something that it was a whole society engagement from politicians to engineers, you know, and and there was buy in to get it done, right? Um, and it happened in, in in about a decade of time or something like that, right? Everything that we've talked about today has has been a system, has been a network, has been something where what the message that I've heard again and again is it can't just be an engineer in their lab or in their own little corner solving the, all the problems, right? And, 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 and so I, I think there is a lot of optimism. Um, I think where the pessimism comes through is that we're saying, hey, there's a smart person, there's a powerful person over here, and they're not doing it exactly the right way. And and that's an that's an education opportunity. That's a chance for us to say, hey, wait a minute, here's here's how how to make it a little bit better. Right. And and I think I think the network effect is what is gonna, in my opinion, get us through this, get us to the other side. Great. Well, so we've reached the end of our time, but um Professor Sandrin, do you want to um end our panel with? No, um, I, I, I agree with all the points and I, I, I am also uh, relatively optimistic um, and um, I, I think uh, there is a lot of work being done and uh, people are getting more aware of the um, and uh, cognizant of the severity of the situation. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I agree with all the comments. Let, let me jump in here and and uh, before we lose people, let's thank all the panelists. Thank you, Miriam, for doing a wonderful job. Thank you, all the panelists. It was thought provoking. <laughs>